Hi everyone and welcome to Squirrel Pie Productions. My name is Tommy. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Dynamite Trujillo. Welcome to episode 83 of my podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you are a new viewer, welcome. Thank you for being here. And if you're a returning viewer, a big welcome back. Today is a beautiful sunny, bright, and warm Friday in September here on the Northern California coast where I'm coming to you from. You can find the show notes for this episode, which will contain a plethora of links relating to the things that I talk about in today's episode, right down there in the description box below. In the description box, you will also find a link to the Ravelry group, which you should go check out and join. If you haven't yet, we have some fun stuff that is our some fun stuff's going to be happening in the Ravelry group coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. I will talk about it in approximately one to two minutes. But first, I would like to tell you about an event that I'm going to be participating in in October during Rhinebeck Weekend, because Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival, which happens in New York, is happening in October, which is next month, which is really soon. Are you going? Are you excited? Are you going to have so much fun? <sighs> I have never been to it. I live in California, which is just about the farthest you can get from Rhinebeck. Um, the only other place in the States that's even farther than me is Los Angeles. And if you happen to be in the Los Angeles area, I'm really good at this, huh? If you happen to be in the Los Angeles area uh, during Rhinebeck weekend, which is October 19th through, okay, okay, the weekend of October 19th, there's going to be a event, a, a blah, blah. I am good at this, an event called Rhinebeck West, which is being hosted by the lovely Knitting Tree in Inglewood, California, which is in the Los Angeles area. So on October 19th, 19th and 20th at the Knitting Tree, they are going to be putting on a really amazing event that's going to be a version of Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival if you can't make it to Rhinebeck because you live in California. <laughs> Um, and the way I'm going to be participating is I am going to be dyeing up an event exclusive colorway that I believe you will only either be able to get at the event or perhaps through the knitting tree, um, even if you don't go to the event. I'm not sure though, don't quote me on that. But there will be an exclusive colorway and I'm really excited, I'm so honored and happy to be joining in on this festival. And kind of their idea was to get together um, a bunch of California uh, dyers and makers and designers to participate. So there's some really cool people participating. Um, there's an Instagram page that has more information about what's going on at this event. And um, it's at Rhinebeck West, I think. It's going to be right here. <laughs> but you should go check that out and follow it if it's something you're interested in. I hope you can go. I uh, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but I unfortunately can't go to that either because it is also very far away from me. We're both in California, but me and Los Angeles are on opposite ends of the state, and this is a very long state. So unfortunately, I won't be able to actually attend Rhinebeck West, but um, I will be there in yarn form. So I'll be sending off a whole bunch of skeins of that colorway to the event. And I'm really excited. I think it's a really cool idea and I'm really honored to be a part of it. So yeah. Okay. If you're in LA during Rhinebeck and you want to go to Rhinebeck, but you can't go to Rhinebeck West instead. I hear there's a brewery in the parking lot. Just saying. Okay. I think there's going to be goats. I wish I could go. It sounds like so much fun. Okay. Anyway. So that is October 19th and 20th from 10 to 6, 10 to 6. Be there, Los Angelesians. If you don't know this about me, I am actually from Los Angeles. I live in Northern California in the Redwoods, in the deep, deep north of Northern California. I, people consider the Bay Area Northern California. I'm about six hours north of there, five to six hours. I drive slow. So, um... But yeah, I grew up in LA. I was born in Pasadena. I grew up in Highland Park and Eagle Rock and Montrose areas. LA is a very big, very sprawling city. Within Los Angeles, there are a ton of other pretty much cities proper. Um, 
but it's it's a huge area and it's wonderful. I love Los Angeles. I am not, I discovered about myself, I'm not really a person who enjoys living in the city. I enjoy living where I live now, which is kind of out in the boondocks. But um, I love Los Angeles. It holds a very dear place in my heart. There are a lot of iffy things. There's the Los Angeles stereotypes that everybody dislikes. And I get that. There are those things. But there are also a lot of really amazing and wonderful people and places in Los Angeles that make it such a rich and big and sprawling community. There's so much about Los Angeles. You could live there for 18 years like I did and not even experience half of it. It's a wonderful place. And that is why, that is one of the reasons why I'm very excited to be participating in Rhinebeck West, October 19th and 20th. Anyway, moving on to my next announcement. I am beginning a make-along. So <laughs> this make-along is called the Flashy Make-Along. And I, uh, it's, it's the, um, it's the anti-practical is what it is. So if you follow Kristen of Bull and Vine, she has got, uh, the wonderful YouTube channel Bull and Vine, and she is on that channel hosting her own make-along right now called the Practical, where you make something that's practical for your road wardrobe, which is great and I love the idea of that make along and it's super awesome and you should join it. But for some reason, when she was talking about that make along, hey squirrel, that's my cat. So when I was watching Kristen's YouTube channel and she was talking about the practical, for some reason, every time she kept saying things like practical in my head, I was just responding with flashy. <laughs> so I decided to, um, start my own make-along, uh, where you can make anything that you want that is unpractical, something really flashy, something really in your face and like fancy and sparkly and loud and special occasion-y or costume-y or, um, it doesn't have to be too extreme. You know me and my make-alongs, pretty much anything will fly. But the idea is um, anything that's not practical, something that's flashy, something that's, um, you know, you know. I actually Googled synonyms for flashy so that I could uh, be a little more specific for all those who like detail. So when you're thinking to yourself, does what I'm thinking of qualify for the flashy make along? Think about this list of words. Does it apply? Do you feel in your heart like it applies? Flashy, gaudy, garish, showy, flamboyant, loud, tawdry, ostentatious, glitzy, ornate, tasteless, vulgar, meretricious, I don't know what that is. I guess it means flashy. Tacky, splashy, jazzy, snazzy, extravagant, that's a good one. Sparkling, pretentious, pompous, cheesy, brassy, tatty, bright, coarse, dashing, inelegant, elegant, inelegant, baroque. Okay, anyway, you get the gist. Um, so this is going to be a make-along for garments or shawls. I've decided to include, shawl, include shawls too because you can get pretty out there with some big shawls. Um, so... Garments, shawls, flash. That's what this make-along is all about. Um, any craft is welcome. It just, like I said, has to be a garment, something that you can wear. And um, so knitting, crochet, sewing, other things that you can, I don't know, taking a thrift store uh, prom dress and Frankensteining it into some other piece of clothing. You know, I don't know. And this is gonna be a make-along that's gonna run until the end of the year. So, think about your Halloween costumes, think about your um, holiday get-ups, think about your New Year's Eve party outfits. That's what, we're, that's what I'm thinking here. So anyway, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I got the okay from Kristen because I had had a couple of drinks when I thought of this idea and I was like, maybe it's mean to just kind of copy somebody's make along and like 
make it the opposite. So I, I got I got the approval. She's on board. She's fine with it. So don't worry about offending. Take part in both knit-alongs. Make yourself some practical things. Make yourself some garish things. I think that's a, what a balanced wardrobe has, right? Right? Yes. So I think that's pretty much, those are pretty much all the details. Like I said earlier, I'm not one for rules and boundaries of that sort. So have at it. If you feel like it's gonna work, then I'm gonna be okay with it. Whips are welcome. Do what you gotta do. There's gonna be a Ravelry, th uh, Ravelry, what? There's gonna be a Ravelry thread in the Ravelry group for chatter so that you can discuss what you're planning, what you're doing, show us progress, pictures, stuff like that. Share patterns. <gasps> Maybe I should come up with a pattern list like she did. I don't know. We'll see. If I do, I'll link it below. Uh, there's going to be an FO thread too in the Ravelry group and like normal I will also come up with a hashtag which will probably, I haven't checked it yet, but it'll probably be hashtag uh, flashy M-A-L, right? Yeah, flashy M-A-L on Instagram. And when I do draw prizes at the beginning of 2020, I will draw from the FO thread on Ravelry and from the Instagram hashtag. So join in. I'm so excited to have you um, making all of the... Now I'm really into the word garish. <laughs> like, let's make all the garish pompous things together. Okay, so that's that. That's new make-along. Awesome. Do you want to talk about some FOs? I have a couple FOs. The first is my diaphanous raglan. This is a pattern by Jessie Mae Martinson, and I love it so much. I am going to get up so that you can see it. First, I'm going to drink some coffee. Because who sleeps anymore? Okay. Let's do all the garment shuffling. Ta-da! So this is my diaphanous raglan. It, why do I keep saying raglan? It's a wonderful pattern. I love it so much. I think you should make one because it's amazing. So I used Moonstone Dye Works in the Merino Single Base in the Ursula colorway, held together for the body portion with a lace weight in the same colorway. This is not a base I carry in the shop. It's just a random skein that I had. And then so the body is both of those yarns held together. The sleeves are just the lace weight. And, oh, I love it so much. So it's a top-down garment. It's a crop top. And it starts with this deep V. There's also a deep V in the back. And then you do a bunch of really rapid waist shaping decreases here. And then there's some ribbing at the bottom. I'm going to go into some other details about that after I sit down because I did change some stuff, of course. And then I've got these really beautiful, really long bell sleeves on it. And I just love it so much. It's got a really cool v-neck ribbing detail. And there she is. Ta-da! I love it so much. I really, really do. Okay. I'm going to sit down there and talk about it. Hello. Oh, now I have to get comfortable. Okay. Okay, so I've been working on this thing for, I don't know, like maybe a month or something. You see me at different stages of it. And it was... It's just a really great pattern. It's really well written. It's got different options. There's like, a, I think three or four, maybe five. I don't know. There's a few different sleeve style options. I went with bell sleeve, which is probably the simplest sleeve style. And um, I love it. I've, I've been considering even adding a little bit more length to them, but they're good for now. Um, there's also the option to do waist shaping or no waist shaping to make it a little more boxy. I did the waist shaping and let's see. So for the waist, I you're supposed to do, this is the length that it calls for. Um, I knit it exactly to pattern in terms of length, but you are supposed to have the ribbing go up another inch. See, this is where the 
waist decreases stop, pretty much the ribbing is supposed to start right there and go all the way down. But I kind of decided to do a little more stockinette so the ribbing starts down here. I'm very happy with that decision because I feel like the ribbing would have started right under my bust line, which I feel like would have kind of portioned me a little weird, so I'm really glad I did that. Um, I don't know why this happened, but I've got these eyelets on the raglan shaping, and I don't think other people have that, and I know that I did the increases correctly, because you know, different types of increases can give you a different finish. And I don't think anybody else has this. And I did the increases, like I said, correctly and consistently among all the different parts where you do increases. And this between the yarn held double and the single lace just gave me these eyelets. And I thought, I thought it was weird at first because, and that's why I was like, am I doing it wrong? And I doubled and triple checked. Um, and I was like, no, I guess that's just how it's supposed to be because it's all consistent and it looks pretty good. And then um, I think it was Bad Betty Knits on Instagram was like, oh, cool modification you did with putting eyelets there. And I was like, that, I was right the first time. This isn't right. <laughs> Nobody has that. Uh, so I don't know what I did, but that's how it turned out. And I think it looks really, really cool. So it worked out. Um, but yeah, I don't know how to get it to not do that. Like everybody else who has knit this pattern got it to not do that. But it's all right. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I just love it so much. I have been wearing it over my Stasia dress, which is a pattern that I really want to make more of. It's a Jersey skater style dress. And it's black with like accents of like kind of a beigey gold that are really subtle. And I think this looks really good with it. And I got to get more dresses like that to wear it over, to wear this over because I am growing more and more fond of the crop top as time goes by, but I, and I'm definitely developing a style of outfit to go with the crop top. And I am, I, ever since I had a baby, my body has been very different than it was before. And none of my jeans fit anymore. I've always worn jeans and leggings. Um, but none of my jeans fit anymore. And I've tried purchasing more jeans in like the size that I am now. And none of it, it's just, it just doesn't work. I don't know, like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I cannot find a pair of jeans that I feel comfortable in. Not the way I look, cause I feel like I'm getting jeans in my current size that I think look pretty good. They're just physically uncomfortable, you know, to wear. Either they're too tight or they feel fine when I put them on, but by halfway through the day, they're like, falling down because they've stretched out and I, I I've tried many different styles and types and I just can't get it right so crop top and jeans is out for me right now um crop top that shows my midriff I've just never been into that um that's just an area of skin I'm not interested in showing so this kind of thing where I have like my bottoms and then the crop top and then this is just an undershirt and I wear an undershirt under almost any everything anyway, I think that's a really cool look. So if I do get some jeans eventually, I think that could be a cool look. I also just really like things like this over dresses right now. And right now I'm wearing it with a skirt, which is something I will talk about later. And I think that looks really cool too. So this particular outfit I think is really neat looking. So anyway, Jessie Mae Martinson is a really, really good pattern designer. Um, she's definitely kind of having a moment right now, and I think it's really well-deserved because the patterns she's been coming out with have just been like, so cool. I've taught, I've said the same exact thing on the podcast like more than a few times before, but they're unique, they're interesting. I feel like they're, um, they're, the, her style is getting popular right now. And I think it's, uh, I think it's good because it's a really cool style and yeah. Okay, yeah, that's it. I. My thoughts trailed. <laughs> anyway, check out her patterns. I'm really super tempted to cast on another ripple bralette, but in a tank form. I'm also super tempted to cast on a ripple crop, which my friend Jillian from the Good Witch Knits podcast recently knit, kind of recently knit, and I, I, I want, I want to make one of those too. But I got a lot of things on the uh, the old pattern docket right now, so I don't know. We'll see. 
I have another funny random little finished object that I will show you now after I put it on and get re-comfortable because now I'm sitting all weird. Okay, you ready? Wabam. So <laughs> these are some rings that I made by knitting them. Um, these came about because my sister, who does still live in Los Angeles, um, requested a knitted ring that she found on Pinterest because I think she like burned her finger somehow, like, I don't know, cooking or something maybe. And her doctor told her to keep it out of the sun. So she wanted something to cover it up. Uh, this was probably a couple week and a half ago or so. So it's probably healed by now, but I am a bad sister and it took me forever to make this thing. I just finished all three of these last night and blocked them because I'm the weirdo that blocks everything, even if it doesn't matter, I blocked these. Um, so they're rings. This one, this one is the one that she, that is for my sister, and she gave me specifications. She wanted it two and three quarters inches around, and between a half inch and three quarters of an inch long, so that's what I did. And I just cast on using, and it's really big for me, so it's on my thumb. She has bigger fingers than me, I guess, I don't know. But, um, it's, I cast, what did I cast on? 18, 22 stitches. So what I did to figure out how to make one of these things, because I, I, I vaguely searched Ravelry for the pattern. And I'm like, this is dumb. I'm just going to make it up because it's just a little too stockinette. So luckily I had knit a pair of socks out of this yarn. This is Moonstone Dye Works BFL sock in the Aquarian colorway. And so I got that sock out. I measured its gauge and I with a very easy calculation, figured out how many stitches I need to get uh, two and three quarter inches. And then I subtracted a few stitches so that there was a little bit of negative ease. So I ended up with 22 stitches and I did a German twist of cast on because I wanted it to be stretchy and I knit for some length of knitting and then I bound off. And it definitely <laughs> has this shape where it's a little bit of a bell. It's tighter at the top and wider at the bottom because of the nature of the cast on and the bind off that I did, but it's fine. I feel like on a human hand, it's kind of anatomical, so meh. And because this took so little time to make, I was like, it would be pretty cool if I made one for my nieces as well. So that way, um, my two nieces and their mom all have matching rings. So I got out some other scrap yarn. This one is Cat Sandwich Fibers in the Taffy 2.0 colorway. This one is Moonstone Dye Works in the Stone Cold Manor colorway. This one I did 16 stitches and this one's 18. So I just kind of experimented. And I think they're pretty cute. Like, will I make one for myself and wear it around? Probably not. But I think they're pretty cute for like a couple little kids and like somebody who wants to cover like a minor injury on their finger, right? So that's, uh, these are my three other finished objects. Making a total of four finished objects for this episode. So impressive. And um, yeah, that's pretty much, I think, all of the pertinent information about these. Hopefully I actually take a picture of these so I can put them on my Ravelry projects page. That way if anybody's interested in replicating, they can even, I mean, seriously. Cast on like 20 stitches. Oh, I used a size zero needle. I figure fingering weight, sock gauge, cast on 20-ish stitches, knit for a little while, bind off. It worked out. I'm happy. And yeah, that's those. Paige, that was for you. Yeah. Paige the Framer has an amazing podcast that you should totally watch. It's called, it's called something like the one with dot, 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 and then it's like whatever the title is. The one with Paige the Framer, maybe that's what it's called. Anyway. Moving on to whips, my works in progress. I have a few. I have a few little works in progresses here. Living in my drawstring linen project bag with my amazing fat squirrel pin on it are my linen socks. And right now it's just one sock and it's inside out because I was weaving in the ends. So this is a pattern, The Lynn Socks by Don Henderson. 
It's a shorty sock pattern with a scalloped cuff and I love it. So I finished the first one. It's a top down sock. The original pattern calls for twisted stitching in this scallop rib and also in the rib down the front, but I don't do twisted stitches because I don't like them. So I just changed it to regular ribbing and regular knit stitches in the scallop. And I think it still looks really great. So it's got a real small little cuff and then a heel flap and gusset. And the rest of the sock is just ribbing on the top and stocking it on the bottom. The yarn that I'm using is Knox Yarn Co. In the gorgeous and beautiful Bifrost colorway. I love it so much. I believe this is her Mars sock base. It's like the, um, it's that kind of superwash merino sock yarn where it's superwash merino and nylon and it's a really like kind of thin, smooth, multi, it's more than a two ply. It's like, what is it, is it four ply? Who cares? Do you care? I don't know why I'm doing this. Four ply, it's four plies. Um, and I really, really, really like it. Um, I haven't cast on the second one yet. In fact, I actually stole the needles the right over there to make these rings because I knew it was just hanging out in the bag with this sock. But the sock fits great. It's got a regular wedge toe and it's wonderful. I have the ends woven in already because that's how I do because I don't like doing it at the end except for the one sock that I just finished, which will be the second sock when I finish it. That's that. My next whip is another pair of socks. I cast on a new pair of socks. These are living in my emerald, fiber, emerald fibers. What? I can't say things and I drop things. What's going on? I don't know. Emerald fibers bag, and it's beautiful. So this is a pair of socks that I am knitting for a friend of mine who is a very knitworthy friend. He wants a poncho. I said I'll knit you socks. <laughs> um, so I'm using this yarn. It's West Yorkshire Spinners. I got this from the Wooly Thistle. Very unlike me. I made like an online purchase from a shop and just got like one skein of yarn and paid the shipping. Very unlike me. So this is their signature four ply and it's in their like bird self striping collection and it doesn't say on here but I know that it's the owl colorway and I chose this colorway because I thought it would go well with him and his personality but also he's an owl biologist and he's not he's a wildlife biologist but right now he works with owls so how perfect is that I don't know if I'm gonna tell him that or not because it's pretty cheesy I'm probably gonna tell him because he thinks that stuff is cool so here's what I have so far. It's just ribbing mostly for now. So it's a self-striping-ish or whatever, and it's got brown, beige, navy blue, forest green, and then like a gray and white speckle in between each of those colors. I did a 72 stitch cast on, two by two ribbing, and I just started the stockinette a few moments ago. I'm using my size one Chiagu twist minis. The last socks were size zero. Now size zero is my current sock needle of choice, um, but I'm using a size one for these because the way that I measured his foot was that I had him try on Colin's last socks that I made him while I was still knitting them. So I had like the one hoe that was done, had him try it on and it fit except for the length. So I used a size one for those because I started those ages ago back when I used to use a size one before I went down to a zero. So I figured for consistency sake, because I knew those fit him, I would do it on a size one. I don't love the fabric. It's very loose because that's what happens. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is compare this to those socks that I knit for Colin that are done now and see and just make sure because if these are turning out like bigger or something then I'm gonna go down to a size zero because I like zeros better but also a looser knit gives a more stretchy fabric and not in a good way but still so I don't know we're gonna see I may rip these back and start again on a zero and maybe just go up in stitch count I'm not sure I don't know I might just stick with it because 
So that's that. The beginnings of a another big old giant sock. But I like it. I like that yarn. Again, I got it from the Wooly Thistle, which is a really great online shop that carries um, yarn from Europe, mostly, right? Is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that's cool. My last work in progress, which is the other big thing that I've been working on after I finish this, it's living in my woodsy and wild hunt. Woodsy and wild Halloween bag with pink pom-pom on it. It's my Arachna Pullover by Andy Satterland. And I like it. So I'm almost done with the yoke. I cast this on a couple weeks ago. So in the last episode, you saw just a little bit of the yoke where I was, and now I am almost done with the yoke. I think I have a few more rounds to do before I can do, I think like, just a tiny bit of plain stockinette and then I'll separate for the sleeves and be on body land where I get to just do stockinette with one color yarn. It's gonna be great. So this is what I have so far. Uh, the Arachna is a top down yoked pullover with a color work yoke that is a spider web. And I love, uh-oh, I lost some stitches in my enthusiasm. I love spiders. I love spider webs. And so this pattern spoke to me. And the yarn that I'm using for the main color is this. This is Elemental Effects Cormo Sport. It's a 100% non-superwash Cormo Sport weight yarn that I got from the Starlight Knitting Society booth at Stitches West this year. And for the color work, I'm holding these two yarns together. This is some hand spun of mine from Spunky Eclectic, and it's fin wool in the aquarium colorway, not to be confused with my aquarian colorway. Aquarian is for you aquarians out there, and this is aquarium for fish houses. So this is, the, this is the hand spun that I'm using, um, but it was kind of a fingering weight and this is a sport weight sweater. So I decided to hold it with some lace weight yarn. And this is some Merino silk lace weight from Fiber Nymph Dye Works. It's called, of course I forgot again, because I always forget what this is called. Do, 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 do. I totally didn't write it down. Gr girls. I don't know what it's called. It's in last week's show notes. I'll look it up and put it down below or something. Um, but it's pink. It's bubblegum pink and I am holding it together with this green with a bunch of different shades of like bright green. And it's turning out really cool. I like it. I was second guessing it at first because it felt weird, but I think it looks really cool. And this is my current entry into the flashy cow because let's face it, this is super flashy. It's a spiderweb yoke sweater and it's weird in color. So this is my entry so far. Now this pattern has been really great. I did totally mess up the color work, but I don't care. So the color work is, um, given to you in two different charts that apparently you're supposed to alternate throughout the whole round. So this is supposed to be one chart, this is the next chart. One chart, okay, so like the chart A, chart B, chart A, chart B. I did not get that from the instructions. I did, I, I didn't, I mean, it's, I figured it out eventually, but uh, I don't think the instructions were, entire no they're probably clear I'm just like whatever I don't know it's, it's my fault it's totally my fault <laughs> but anyway I was working from one single chart the whole time because I thought you were supposed to work from one chart and then like the next chart but that wasn't the case 
I did not read the instructions well enough until I was almost at the end of the charted section. And then I was like, wait, aren't I almost done? How do I have this whole other chart that I still have to do? And then I, I, re I read and reread and reread the instructions until I figured it out. But pretty much the only thing is that, so now all my spiderweb sections are the same. And the way it's supposed to be is you're supposed to have two sections next to each other that kind of like, instead of just arc identically, are supposed to kind of go out like that. You know what I mean? Kind of like spider legs. So mine doesn't do that. I even looked on Ravelry. I'm like, does anybody mention that they did it wrong? Or like, did anybody else, can I see in anybody else's projects that they did it wrong like I did? But I couldn't really tell. But, um, so the difference at the top is pretty subtle between the two sections, but at the bottom it becomes more pronounced because the things are bigger. And also you end up at the bottom getting like one line that dips down farther than the next line, if that makes sense. I'll show you next time when it's all done because I have now started doing it correctly. So like the last three little sections are gonna be done correctly. And I thought about just continuing to do it wrong so that it's consistent, but like I said, I think the top sections are so subtle that it's going to be not very noticeable that the bottom ones are different. Um, but I think it is going to have a better effect on those very bottom ones having done the chart correctly. That's my story. About how I messed up my pullover. But I am totally fine with it. I think it's amazing still. So I am knitting this on a US size four, which I believe is what the pattern called for. So that was cool. I swatched, I got gauge, awesome. And I'm almost to the sleeve separation. I really like how the color work, when you see it from back here, you can really tell it kind of gradiates because my hand spun, you know, started with a lighter section and it got darker and darker as you go, as you went. So I think that's really neat, and I like the pop of pink throughout it. And that's pretty much it. It's fun. I am glad the color work is almost over, though. I'm really excited about my stockinette body. So, yes. Spiderweb sweaters. Perfect for Halloween, because it's coming up very soon. Okay, so that's it for my knitting. I now have... A cross stitch section what so I don't cross stitch very often but I have cross stitch materials because I would like to cross stitch more about three ish years ago I'm pretty sure before I even started the podcast I started this one cross stitch and I got very I didn't get very far at all and I picked it up I think every single year since I started it and like put like maybe that much work on it. And I finally picked it up last weekend because my friend Nina from the This Old Knit podcast messaged me and had remembered that I was working on it before. And she, by the way, I just remembered, swearing warning, alert, alert. I am gonna be using a curse word. I'm gonna be showing you a curse word. I'm not gonna like not say it, so FYI. So anyway, she messaged me, remembered that I had been working on that cross stitch like forever ago and asked like who it was from. And so I told her and we talked about it for a minute. And then I was like, man, I should really get that back out. So I got it out and I finished it like the next day. And I'm super excited. And here it is. It's a cross stitch that says it's decorative gourd season, motherfuckers. And it's got some gourds on it. Isn't it wonderful? So this is a cross stitch by Subversive Cross Stitch, which is a company that I really liked for a little while a long time ago. And I have made one of their things before and it hangs on my hallway wall. Um, actually, in my history of cross stitching, I believe I have cross stitched cross cross stitched two things to completion. This is my third. <laughs> and I'm really excited about it. So for the several years that it, it had been sitting unfinished, um, I picked it up last weekend 
And the only thing that was done on it was fuckers. That, oh, and the comma and half the N of season. That's it. That's all I had gotten done in three years. And I did the rest of this in like a day and a half. <laughs> so I'm really, really excited. My plan for this is to um, hang it, or not hang it, but set it up on my mantle above my fireplace in the living room. The first day of fall, which I believe is September 23rd, that is the autumnal equinox. So that's coming up really soon and I'm so excited that I finished it like timely enough to be able to actually use it this autumn. And we always go to a local pumpkin patch and buy a few decorative gourds. We are really into that, so I'm stoked. So I finished the cross stitch. This is um, some brown thread. It's like a really dark brown thread that I used for the letters. And I used like a gold and like a butter yellow and like a really light kind of grass green for all the gourds. They kind of look like pears, but whatever. And uh, to finish it, I have this foam that I purchased from Subversive Cross Stitch years and years ago. I have like two of these little five by seven foam things. They're like that thick. And um, I also have this like cross stitch mounting tape, which is a fat roll of double-sided tape where you put, it's got like a backing and you put the tape down on the board and then you put your fabric over it. Oh wait, you put the tape down on the board and then you take the backing off, then you put the fabric over it and it sticks to it, it's double-sided tape. So that's how I mounted this thing and it's, it's sloppy, I don't care, you know, it's like whatever. I used like an oatmeal colored Ada fabric I don't know the count, but it's pretty big. It's something that I picked up from Joanne's years ago. I really like cross stitch. I don't know how much I'm interested in cross stitching on linen like the fancy people do. I think it looks really cool, but for one, I'm not that dedicated to having really cool looking cross stitch because that seems like way more complicated, not more complicated, but it seems way more annoying to cross stitch on proper fabric than on Ada fabric because the thing about Ada fabric is that the um, warp and weft or the whatever they are <laughs> it's really big and fat so your where you put your stitches actually has little holes in the fabric because it's kind of loose so it's just really easy and like beginner friendly to be able to cross stitch on this and I really like the way it looks too I think it looks really kind of grandma-y and I like that I'm also not terribly interested in cross stitching like all over color pieces, the kind of things that I think, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I like the easy stuff. So, um, and then I just found this frame and I borrowed it from the thing that was already in it. <laughs> and I put this in there cause I'm only gonna be using this seasonally. So I'll take it out once the season is over and store it away in the garage until the following year. But I'm really excited about this. I got this whole thing done and I finally get to use it and I'm really stoked. So if you're interested in kind of cursy, snarky, cross stitchy kind of things that are all kind of of this style where it has like a phrase and then it has like a little uh, border or like pictures but that are kind of secondary to the phrase, you know? That's kind of what they're all about, and they have some good stuff. So check that out if you're interested. That's my cross stitch section for the podcast this week. Oh man, I have a few more things. So sewing, I did some sewing. I participated in Volenvine's Brumby Skirt Sew Along. The Brumby Skirt is a pattern by Megan Nielsen Patterns, and if you're interested in sewing one of these, you should totally do what I did and watch Kristen's vlogs of her sewing this. So their tutorials, their vlog style, it's really fun to watch somebody else sew a pattern that you're sewing as well. And I actually, unintentionally, actually followed the timeline of the sew along because I sewed this, I think I started the first steps of sewing this skirt like the day after I recorded the last episode, which was two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago. And I just finished it like two days ago. So this is one of my, 
that's a long-term project for me. I don't like letting sewing projects linger for that long, but just the way life has been lately, I've only been able to sew for like small bits of time at a time. So it's taken me two weeks to do it. So I ended up doing it in little chunks of things uh, along with how Kristen was doing it in the videos, which was really funny. So let's show you the skirt. All right, let's get myself all adjusted. So, hmm, okay, I know. I know. I'm doing it. Hold on. Okay, you ready? Let's get close. Here's the brumpy skirt. Oh, I love it so much. I'm so super amazingly happy with it. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's got a zipper. It's got these pockets. It's which are really like low and loose and they're pretty shallow, but they're great. It's got a gathered skirt. It's pretty long. It comes down maybe three inches past my knees, which is a length I really like. It's got this nice wide waistband and a zipper. So there it is. I love it so much. Okay, now I'm gonna sit down and talk about it because there's some stuff to talk about. Okay, so this skirt. I made some epic mistakes and failures I made failures, you know what I mean. I had some epic failures and I made some big mistakes with this skirt. In the end, I just love it so much, like a lot. And I would really, really like to make another one, especially now that I'm coming out of this one with some tips for myself <laughs> for the next one. So I used this really amazing, lovely drapey fabric. This is, what is it? Hold on. I have it written down. Side note, I'm sorry, this is a long tangenty episode. Do you wanna know what this is? This is my show notes folder, by the way. So I like the Vlog Brothers. They are a YouTube vlog brother ship and uh their youtube channel is called the vlog brothers if you haven't heard of them check them out they're they're it's a really interesting concept that they have and that they have been doing for a long time and i just like them i like them a lot one of their episodes one of the brothers hank maybe i don't remember asked their viewers which is a lot of people to uh draw the bar that you think of in your head when you hear of a blankety blank walks into a, block, a bar joke. And he, cause he's like, I'm pretty sure everybody has a bar, like a standard bar, like a default bar that you picture when you hear that joke. And when you, when you hear the joke as it's being told, you picture what's happening in this bar. And so I was like, he's right. I do have a bar that I picture. <laughs> And he asked everybody to draw their bar and email it to him, so I did. And that, that's my bar. And it's, it's always in an aerial view, which is why I drew it like that. Oh, anyway. Blah, blah, blah. Stuff no one cares about. What am I looking for? I'm looking for where I wrote down what kind of fabric this is. Here it is. It's Rayon Shelley. And it's olive in color, which I'm just super in love with. And I actually did not buy this fabric for this pattern. I bought it. I have a little list when I made a fabric purchase from fabric.com of like the patterns that I own and what I want to make with what fabric I want to use. So I purchased each fabric on this list and I have it and it all has a pattern that it's going to end up being. Now the pattern that this skirt was supposed to end up being is the bateen dress from Tilly and the Buttons. I have that pattern and 
a long time ago, I saw my friend Becky Sorensen, who is Soprano Knits, make one. And I fell in love with it because it looks so good on her. And so I was like, I'm going to make this thing finally. I have had it for a long time and I've never made it. Um, so I bought this fabric for it. And then I kind of realized, well, I love it on her. I really don't think I'm going to love it on me. And then this skirt came along and I almost had enough yardage. So I was like, I'm just going to use it for that. And I'm so glad I did because it's awesome. Now I had two yards of it. Yeah, I had two yards of it. The pattern calls for maybe two and a half or two and three quarter yards. I eked out the pattern pieces on my two yards. I seriously, this is the closest I've come to not having enough fabric. But I got them all cut out. It was worked out fine. Um, I did cut out the pattern pieces for the 25 inch waist because I'm in denial and I used to be a 25 inch waist and even though I know that now I'm not a 25 inch waist anymore I still cut out the pieces for the 25 inch waist pattern because I was like it's gonna be fine like that's gonna fit because that's what's always fit it doesn't fit anymore um so that's one of my big mistakes that I made is that because of the the bad voice of denial in my head, I cut out the wrong size. So there was that. Um, let's see. Oh, also I, because I was trying to get all my pieces onto the fabric, I knew I didn't want the skirt quite as long as the pattern called for. I made the longest version because that's the one that has the pockets, but I knew I didn't want it that long. So I just cut out some of that length from the start to be able to cut more pieces on my fabric. Also, the pattern calls for the front panel to be in two pieces and you'd have a seam up the front. I didn't want that. I didn't see the point in it. I have another skirt, a couple skirts like that. Um, my, uh, Sewaholic. I made this other skirt by Sewaholic that I'll put the name for down here a couple times and it calls for a seam up the front and I've always disliked it. I was like, I feel like it would look better and like lay neater and flatter if there was no seam here. So instead of cutting two pattern pieces, I just cut it on the fold and kind of took out what the seam allowance would be. So I'm really happy I did that. I think that worked out really great. It saved me having to sew a seam and I think it looks better without a seam up the front personally. So I'm happy I did that. Um, okay, so I constructed it. Construction went great. I put the pockets in, I did the side seams, I gathered the waist, I inserted the waistband. It was all awesome and easy and wonderful and I loved it. Of course, this happened over like a week and a half. <laughs> Um, and then I put it up to me and I was like, I don't know if this is going to close, but I was like, it's going to be fine. So what I did when I inserted the zipper is I, instead of doing a 5 8 inch seam allowance, I did like a quarter inch seam allowance to give myself more room. And I was like, the zipper itself is going to add some width to the waistband. So I was like, it's going to be fine. So I did some experimenting. I sewed a little, I pinned a lot. I tried it on it was not gonna work. It was way too tight. So I took it out, I repinned it, tried to really kind of eke out some more room. And it's still, it just like, I spent like a whole day like on this zipper portion. I like sewed up the back up to the point of the zipper and everything. And I was just like, it's just too small. It's just way too small. I cut out the size that was too small for me and it is not gonna fit. So after bumming really hard for a little while <laughs> and being like, Fuck this project, I just ruined it, I don't wanna work on it anymore. I gathered myself and I was like, okay, what can I do to fix this? Because that's all my fabric. I don't wanna just throw it away. I put so much work into it, I need to be able to fix it somehow. Um, so, oh, and also another modification I made is it calls for a jeans zipper, but instead of using that, because I already have a bunch of zippers um, for, like sewing project bags and stuff because I've sewed a few project bags in my time. Um, I just use like a regular, regular zipper and it's brown because it's what I had. So this is what I ended up doing. I took, okay, standing back up. So the waistband 
was too small. What I decided to do was add to the waistband because I didn't have any more fabric. It was gone. Like even my scraps gone in the trash off away. <laughs> so what I decided would be the thing to do. Why am I standing up? I don't know. Is to add to the waistband using scraps and take out the gathers for a little bit so that I can extend the skirt they already have to the length of my new waistband, new waistband. Also, something I noticed when I first kind of tried it on is that the pockets were crooked. So what they don't tell you, or at least I didn't read, I could have missed it, um, is that when you're doing the gathers, something you gotta pay, they say to like do the gathers and line up your seams, but they don't say to line up your pockets so that they're even. <laughs> So I had one pocket that was like here, like, you know, the top of the pocket where it attaches as a skirt, and another pocket that was like over here. And for a minute I was like, what's going on? Why is it all crooked? It's because I didn't gather it to where the pockets were even. So, so what I ended up doing, because I didn't have any scraps, is I cut about that much off the bottom front of the skirt because I tend to like my skirts to be just a tiny bit longer in the back anyway. So I figured if I cut off that much of the whole length of the front part of the skirt, it would work out fine. And what I could do with this length is cut it up <laughs> and add just about that much to the back of the waistband and maybe it wouldn't look too janky and scrappy, and maybe it'll fit them. So that's what I did. And by the grace of all that is good and mother earthy, it worked. And I couldn't believe it. So there's two waistbands, the outer waistband and the inner waistband, like the inner facing waistband. I did it to the outside waistband first and it was like a miracle, it worked. I was like, oh my God, it worked. But the inner waistband, um, somehow my scraps didn't make it all the way to the edge. It wasn't long enough. So I had to keep adding scraps. So there's like a whole bunch of extra. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. So what you might notice on the back of my skirt is that there's a few extra seams. So you can see them here. So there's not supposed to be all these vertical seams right here, but that was me not only adding in the scrap fabric pieces to the waistband, so those are extra actual seams. There's also a bunch of just sewing lines where I'm, I'm going through at the end and tacking down all of the extra weird fabric I have on the inside. <sighs> so. It was a lot of extra work and it was really frustrating and really just kind of sad, but it worked out and now it fits so good. I'm so happy with how it fits. For a long time, I thought I kind of didn't like these skirts with like the, the waistbands that don't have any stretch or give to them, but it's, I think it's because I was wearing things that were too small for me. So what this, and I measured it. Oh, also I should say that when I had the skirt that was too small, I was like, maybe, I messed up somehow, and this is smaller than it should be. I measured it, it was 25 inches, spot on. <laughs> so I measured this after I completed it, and it's 28 inches is what it ended up being. So I apparently have a 28 inch waist now, and I have measured myself, and I have, like my waist fluctuates as I'm sure many of ours do, like depending on when I ate last, and blah. So sometimes I think it's like 27, but this skirt is 28 inches and it fits fabulously. Like it's comfortable, it looks good, I love it. Um, but I think, I've, I think I just haven't been able to accept it. <laughs> but I accept it now, I wanna go further and start making more skirts that actually fit. So that's cool that I'm like, you know, I'm, I've gotten to that point where I'm like, okay, Let's, I know facts now. Anyway, um, so this skirt worked out really great. It was a lot of trouble, it was a lot of hassle. Do 
entirely to my own mistakes. Oh, and there's more. I'm not even done. So I sewed this whole skirt, finally finished it, put the zipper in. It's beautiful. It's done. I love it. I wore it immediately. I changed my outfit the day that I finished it. And then that night I did laundry and wore it again the next day. The same exact outfit. I wore it to work. And that was two days ago. And at the end of the day, I noticed, oh man, you know what I did? Okay, well, so I finished my seams with pinking shears, which is what I always do because I don't have a serger and I can't be bothered to like sew up zigzag stitches around all of the insides of my seams. So I've always just used pinking shears and it's always worked fine. Even after a whole bunch of washes, it did not work fine with this one. After one wash, the fringes of my seams on the inside completely came apart. There were seams with holes in them that I noticed at the end of the day after I wore it a couple days ago. And the just the, the, the fringe breakdown of the inside seams was right up at my seam where my thread was and like you could see it. So I was like, oh, come on. Will this skirt just never end and be a skirt? So I let it sit there and just this morning, right before filming the podcast, I did some reinforcements. I hope they're going to hold up. We'll see. I really hope they do because I really like this skirt. So I'm going to show you this is, this is really messy, isn't it? So this is my inside side seam. And as you can see, it's really like fray. But what I've gone back and done is done a zigzag stitch and even like at certain points I added even a regular straight stitch just on top of it. And I've tried to reinforce it that way. So hopefully that works. I did that on every single visible seam. Uh, and you can't really tell too much. I was worried that there would be certain points where like, you know, a seam runs into another like the waistband or something and you try to like re-seam right here and it like makes it all wonky. It looks fine. I can't, I mean, especially with the gathered waist, you kind of lose a lot of that stuff. So <laughs> hopefully it holds up now because I added a whole bunch of reinforcements like an hour ago, just like up and down everything. The inside of the pockets were getting holes already. So I reinforced those with a zigzag stitch, just like real hard. Cause you can't even see those. The only kind of bummer thing about this skirt is that the pockets are so like open and drapey and like kind of gapey, which is cool. I think it looks really neat, but it gets caught on stuff. Like I'll be walking around like against something like a dresser with knobs or something and I'll get stuck. And it's because the pocket got stuck on the stuck on the knob. Anyway, unimportant. That's the Brumby skirt. It was just outside of my mistakes that I made that were completely my fault. Um, it was a really simple skirt to sew, which is why I'm really excited about sewing another one. I really want a second one because I think it's gonna go much smoother next time. I highly recommend this skirt in sewing it in your size so that it fits. It's very comfortable and it's very nice to wear. I really like it with this super drapey fabric. Um, I do wish there was a lining in it because this fabric is pretty, well, I mean, it's thin. So, you know, when light shines behind thin fabric, it can be a little see-through. So I'm going to have to wear like a, something under it so that it's not totally see-through. So I like skirts that have linings. I've only tried to put in a lining to a skirt once before, and it was to the Holly burn skirt. That's the skirt I was thinking of before. And I did a bad job because I didn't know what I was doing and I couldn't find really good tutorials on the internet. So, and I was doing that skirt with the um, inside number 23 so long when she did it, but she unfortunately never got to the lining episode, the lining tutorial. So I kind of just did it on my own. And I would like to put a, I gotta just, I think, buy a pattern with a lining that's part of the pattern so that it can tell me how to do it. Okay, there's more. That's it for sewing. I have a favorite section now. I'm gonna make it quick. 
and yes. Okay. So last weekend was my town's local fiber fair. It's called the Natural Fiber Fair and it's held in our community center, which is kind of like a basketball court sized, like regular community center. And I go to it every year and it was really fun this year. I went with my friend Sabrina and it was kind of the best year, I think. There was a, there were a lot of really neat booths. It's a lot of like um, people with a lot of farm yarn um, and from actual farms. So there's not really like that many brands or anything. And um, I got a few things and I'm just going to show you what I got real quick. So the first thing that I bought was an elephant. There was a lady at a booth um, who had a bunch of different stuff like yarn that she had dyed. She had Rolex that she had made from scraps. She had um, a few little things that she had sewn. And this was one of the little toys that she was selling. And she, um, she sewed this out of some old jeans. And this is, this was actually the pocket on the jeans. So it's supposed to be like a tooth fairy thing and you're supposed to, it's just a little pocket. Um, but isn't it like incredible? And she was charging $5 for it. I was like, is this right? Like you made this and you're charging $5. She's like, yeah. So I'm like, okay, so I bought it. And it's for Lucy. And yes, I know it has button eyes, but she plays with it under close supervision and she loves it. It's so cute and adorable and I love it so much. So that was the first thing I got. At the same booth, she had some of those Rolex that she said she just made with like scrap pieces of fiber. This is them. I just thought they were really pretty. I liked the um, kind of scrappy nature of them, so I got them. She included, since I bought these, some silk. So this is, it's just silk. I don't know like the preparation name, but it's just some silk that I will use as an addition to a spinning project. Maybe these, I don't know, we'll see. So that was really nice of her to include that. And then the other thing that I got is some more fiber. I only got fiber. This is from Mendocino Woolen Fiber Co., which is a mill that's pretty close to me. It's in a town called Ukiah, which is, it's a few hours south of where I am, but in terms of mill location, it's very close to me. It's very local. Um, they, I don't know much about them, but they have been milling fiber into like prepped spinning fiber for a while and they just started milling yarn which was really exciting to me um, so I got a few of their braids of this fiber it's 100% California grown Coriadale and Romney grown sheared and processed in Northern California and it's this really pretty oatmeal gray. I got six ounces of it. These are two ounces each. So my idea for this is to spin it pretty thin into a sweater's quantity. My original thought that was that maybe I would spin it into a sweater's quantity and try to natural dye it because natural dyeing is a thing that I've been interested in for a very long time, but I haven't tried. So I thought I might do that, but then I kind of saw all this stuff sitting together and I was like, maybe I should spin it with these like take all of this and hold some of this with it as I spin kind of sporadically. That way it's mostly this gray color with like pops of these colors and even the silk too. I don't know. I thought that would be cool. That way I might even get more yardage. So I don't know, but this is what I got at the Natural Fiber Fair. I had a really good time. It was really great. Um, that's it, I think. Right? Sabrina won a prize. I did not win any prizes. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna leave you there because it was a long episode and we are done. Okay, I hope you're all doing some really fun things, having a really great week, making a lot of awesome things. I hope you make some flashy things with me for our flashy make along. Go check it out on Instagram, hashtag flashy now. And yeah. If you liked the episode, please feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And is that it? Have fun!
and stay awesome. Bye, everybody. <laughs>